Welcome back, everybody. This is the Athlete Hackers Podcast. My name is Chris Schrade. And my name is Mark Spellman. And despite what he thinks, I'm just not as si- is, uh, happy sidekick. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're much more than that to me. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'll, give you the, I'll give you Batman. I'll be Superman or Aquaman. I'm good with it. You were my wrestling teddy bear for quite a while. Um, I'm sure as hell ain't Robin. <laughs> yeah, you wouldn't fit in those tights. No. No. Not at Ep- all. Episode. I think, huh? I think you just called me fat. No, not at all. You got you got big muscles, big bones. <laughs> I'm fat. Robin, Robin's dainty. Yeah, exactly. Episode number four. The history of Ronald strength. Ball. The history of strength and conditioning. This is an interesting one to me because you don't hear about the history of strength and conditioning hardly ever. I've heard it from being around you quite a few times. And I love, I love, I love hearing it every single time, but you usually hear the history of basketball with James Naismith and baseball and football. You also hear all kinds of anecdotes about martial arts, but no one ever talks about the history of strength and conditioning. So you're all in for a very, very good treat today. Okay. Um, first and foremost, I have to uh, disclaimer this, that um, this not, might not be exactly 100% right on the money, um, but uh, I'll give it my best. Um, so back in ancient Greece, um, the Olympians, um, there was a gentleman by the name of Milo, and Milo wanted to get stronger um, for whatever reason. Uh, be healthier. I don't know if he participated in the uh, ancient Olympiads or not, but so something that he did, he decided he just had an, uh, the family just got a calf or the, their cow just gave birth to a baby calf. So every day he would go and pick it up, put it on his shoulders and walk with it. Well, as we know, calves get bigger. <laughs> heavier um, and bigger and heavier <laughs> um so every time that the cow got bigger and heavier it forced milo to get stronger and bigger as well so eventually you know the the calf grows to full cow and milo's still able to pick up the cow put it on its shoulders and walk with it did he walk up a mountain wasn't that I, I, I don't know. I mean, I wasn't there. <laughs> um, a, a mountain sounds good. I mean, sure, why not? It's a folk um, tale. Yes, but at the same time, it's your first evidence of progressive re- overload, mm-hmm. which when you're talking about strength and conditioning is very important to do. Um, I see, you know, you see – uh, I've seen a lot of quotes out now with the pandemic going on and, you know, an organism doesn't change unless there's stress put upon it. So you can either change for the better and come out of this thing, uh, you know, a beautiful butterfly coming out of its cocoon, or you can take the stress and go the other way with it, um, which isn't a good, it isn't a good, it's a bad place to be. For sure. Um, now, has, anyone, has anyone put any numbers? I know it's just a legend, but has anyone put any numbers to that? Because a baby calf's got to be heavy as hell to begin with. That's got to be yeah. a couple hundred pounds already. Yeah, baby calves aren't, aren't, aren't like baby humans. And, and I, I want to see how, how fast they actually grow to full size. You know, if they're, they're full size within a year or two, he's, he's making some gains pretty quick in that story. Yeah, pretty quick. Um, I mean, he's probably doing some other things. Probably, he's probably doing simple things like he's eating right, drinking enough water, getting enough sleep. And doing farm work all day. And doing farm work all day. So, I mean, he's doing things. He's functionally training. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's why, and you know, going jumping way ahead in the story, um, you know, we're going to get to the father of collegiate strength and conditioning, Boyd Epley. Boyd Epley was a track and field athlete at the University of Nebraska. Um, 
I believe, and, and Coach Epley, I'm sorry if I do this story no justice or I'm incorrect with my information. But as I stated at the beginning, um, some of the things that I'm going to tell you might not be 100% on the money. Um, he got hurt, I believe his freshman, or no, maybe his junior or senior year. I believe he hurt his knee. I also believe that Coach Epley was a pole, a pole vaulter. Um, so during his rehab, he was in the Nebraska weight room or in their athletic training room. I'm going to say weight room because it just is, it's a better fit. And some of the football players saw that he was doing some things that they weren't doing. Um, and he's getting stronger and, and getting fitter. And some of them wanted to join him uh, with his training, and they did. What year and, are we talking here? Um, I'm going to say in the 1950s, maybe okay. 60s. Um, you know, once again, I can look that up uh, and I can get more accurate on that information. Um, you keep, you keep but, going. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look it up right now. Yep. Boyd Epley, B-O-Y-D, last name Epley, E-P-L-E-Y. He's the father of the NSCA, which is the National Strength and Conditioning Association. Uh, and I believe he's back at the University of Nebraska working now still. So he uh, he then approached the football coach at the time. I believe it was Bob Devine. And uh, Coach Devine said, yeah, the football team can work with you. But if any of them, if any of them gets slower, you're fired. So welcome, welcome to the world of uh, what we know today as uh, collegiate strength and conditioning. So for those individuals that have not thanked Coach Epley, um, you, owe them, you owe him a great, great, great thank you. Um, the, other, the other individual that I'm going to talk about is uh, Dan Riley and Arthur Jones. Uh, Dan Riley uh, was the strength and conditioning coach at West Point. Uh, after West Point, he was at uh, the Washington Redskins. From the Washington Redskins, he was with the Houston Texans and is currently uh, enjoying uh, semi-retirement and uh, does a couple uh, public speakings throughout the year. Um, but he and Arthur Jones, when uh, Coach Riley was at West Point, Arthur Jones, who is the father of Nautilus, the CAM system, if, you, if anybody's uh, been in the weight room, and seeing the machines used, they were designed and developed uh, in accordance with the strength curve. If you've ever done a, a, a lift, a bench press, a pull down, a seated row, an overhead press, you know that you're stronger at certain points than other points throughout the movement. And uh, Arthur Jones developed the cam system that looks like a, the inside of a clam, uh, inside of a shell. So that's why their symbol is the shell. Um, and that CAM system uh, paid uh, particular uh, specific aspects to that strength curve. So where you were strongest, where you were strongest, it was harder. And where you were weakest, it was a little easier. So they also came up with the high intensity training methodology, which uh, you do one set to failure, then you go on to another exercise. Um, and they found at West Point, yeah, you don't really have a lot of free time. So doing three sets of 10 of any exercise versus doing one set to failure. They did a study and they showed that the athletes uh, got as strong, gained as much lean muscle mass, and spent a third of the time doing the exercises. So you got more bang for your buck. More efficiency. Um, yeah, efficiency. Um, nowadays, you have a variety of methodologies and ways to do things. I believe in our first episode, I used the analogy of the answer is four. Whether it's the square root of 16, eight divided by four or two plus two, we all got to four. So as a strength and conditioning coach, my, my goal is to meet every athlete where they're at and use whatever methodology works best for them to become the best version of themselves so they can perform at the highest level possible and be the most successful that they can be. 
um, whether that's um, using Joe Ken's methodology, uh, Big House, he was the strength and conditioning for the Carolina Panthers, uh, whether it's Brandon Lilly's cube methodology, um, whether it's using West Side Barbell conjugate method, there's a lot of different methodologies out there. Um, but as I listened to a podcast this morning on my walk with my dog, um, Coach Mickey Marotti, who's the head, who's the athletic director for athletic performance for the Ohio State University. And that's right, it's the Ohio State University. Um, puts it, it's, it's not the methodology, but it's more your philosophy. Um, because all the methodologies work, but at the end of the day, you still have to have a strong philosophy and a belief system with what you're doing. And it's not about sets and reps. It's more about where you're meeting your athletes, where you're meeting them at, and what they need to become the best that they can be, whether that's using Olympic lifts, whether it's taking from powerlifting, whether it's using high-intensity training. I think nowadays you see less individuals that are stuck in certain training methodologies, and they just are using a little from this, a little from that, and trying to combine it to make their own, which I think is the best way to go about it because you're going to have a freshman come in who's never been in the weight room, and you're going to have a junior or senior that's in the uh, training facility, and you can't really train them the same. Now, your philosophies can be the same, but your methodologies for both athletes are probably going to be very different. Yeah, it's like, it's like MMA. You throw out what doesn't work and you keep what does. And what does work, you know, a lot has to do with the individual themselves. Well, and, and you look at it, when MMA started, most people weren't doing different training. I mean, MMA started, the UFC started to showcase the power of Brazilian jiu-jitsu. And they did, it, they did a very good job of it. I mean, obviously. Um, but now, if you have a fighter coming up and they're not training in all different aspects of mixed martial arts, if they're not a true mixed martial artist, they're probably not going to win. They're going to be exposed. It's they're going to be exposed. That the strategy up. is going to be to attack that that weakness and they will lose eventually. Yeah, exactly. I mean, they're going to go against somebody who's going to know something that they don't know or have they haven't been exposed to at a high level and they're not going to be successful. So getting back to the strength and conditioning port, like you need to expose your athletes to all these different types of training methodology, find what works best for them and make sure that they're doing it as a progressive overload and that, you know, one of the concepts that I'm probably going, that I know I'm going to adapt to and implement when I'm a director again is that it's going to be, you know, a very undulating, periodized method where it's going to change day to day depending on where the athlete is day to day. You know, I think one of the best studies, one of the most interesting studies, and, I've, and I think I've told you this one, I've told, told you about this one multiple times, is a study that they did at the University of Missouri. And uh, Brian Mann did the study, I believe. And it compared um, injuries during two-a-days versus high-test high uh, times. So you had the football team going through two-a-days, very physically demanding, very mentally demanding. And they compared it to when the uh, football players had very high-test periods of time during the scholastic year. And they found that the athletes during the high test periods had a higher rate of injury than the athletes during two days. Very interesting. Very interesting. So as a strength and conditioning coach, if you're not taking into aspects all the different parts of your athletes' lives, whether it be academic stress, whether it be emo emotional stress, whatever's going on at home, whatever's going on with their significant other, um, whether they've had enough sleep for the day, whether they're properly hydrated or whether they're not eating properly. So there's a lot of different things nowadays that a lot of people, that a lot of people in my profession and your profession need to take into account when they're working with athletes. You know, um, one of, one of the uh, most interesting things that I saw when, when I saw it, when I used to come visit you, when you work in a Fairfield U um, and just to showcase 
the sophistication and where strength and conditioning has gone was your coordination with the physical therapist, you know, understanding what kind of injury an athlete had, what his recovery time was going to be and what you needed to do in coordination with the physical therapist to get that athlete back into the game. Oh yeah. I mean, uh, you know, coach Marathi talked about it today. He, uh, he oversees, he oversees everybody that comes in contact with any one of the football players. So he oversees all the strength and conditioning coaches, all the athletic trainers, any of the sports psychs, any of the nutrition people, anybody that comes in contact with any athlete at the Ohio State University um, is overseed by Mickey Marathi. And that includes the doctors. You know, so I think that's, I think that's the way our, my profession is going, our profession is going. And I love that strength and conditioning coaches are being put up to that level because, you know, as I've seen and you've seen me at Fairfield, I was one guy and I dealt with every sport with athletic trainers. They had a staff of five and they only dealt with their individual sports. Yeah. Well, if, if you're dealing with an athletic trainer and, and one of his sports is women's soccer, what can you tell me about the men's soccer team? Probably not much. Mark Spellman, the hardest working man in strength and conditioning. 5 a.m. <laughs> doing jujitsu with, uh, with a big doofus like myself. 6 a.m. first team in, and you're not leaving until 7, 8 o'clock at night, are you? Maybe. <laughs> you know, maybe I'm getting home by 9. But, you know, as I talked to a lot of the, the strength coaches that came before me and are my age, that's what we did. You know, and that's what, you know, that's what makes us – that's what's made us good at what we do because we have that experience with 20 different teams and yep. 400 athletes, you know, where, where a lot of, a lot, I think, you know, a lot of, a lot of strength coaches nowadays are coming up and they want to work with just basketball or just football. And that's great. But, you know, as a former division three swimmer, my sport wasn't any less important to me than, the star football player, the star basketball player. So, you know, I take my personal experience as a division three swimmer and I, and I look at it, you know, when the golfer comes in or the field hockey player comes in or a sport that you don't think is that in quotes important. I know what it feels like to go into the training room and not have anybody talk to me about my injuries. I know what that feels like because it was done to me. So, you know, I never downplay the importance of any athlete or any sport when they come into my facility. I always told my athletes, I'm going to treat you like the, the best, the best athlete we have because I, I'm not going to differentiate. And, you know, you see a lot of schools and a lot of programs and a story that was brought up. I forgot who told it this week, but they had two players that did the same thing. They both stole something from a convenience store. One was the walk-on and one was the starting quarterback. The walk-on got thrown off the team and the starting quarterback, he like missed two days of practice. Hmm. So, I mean, treat everybody, treat everybody fairly. Well, it also goes back to uh, the episode we had before this cross training. It works in MMA. It works in sports for the youth. It also works when you're a strength coach and you get to see all the different athletes. You focus on one and, that's all you're going to know. And yep. you, but you know, you do a multitude of, of different people, different sports, different movements, your time under tension, your, the, the reps that you're getting in, you're going to master something at a much more higher level than if you were to specialize. Yeah. And you're going to be able to bring you, you here's a, here's a novel concept. You might be able to bring something from one sport and use it with, another sport that you're working with yep you know I, I know that sounds crazy but you know part of the reason a lot of the strength coaches want to work with those sports is one pays more money two you're spending less time you're not going to work as much you know um and that's fine uh, you know I, I i think everybody should do what they're passionate about and go after what they want to do but at the same time i understand that you got to pay your dues i mean I, when I talked to Marcus Sanovich last week, one of the biggest things I brought up, we had to paint all the weights. We had to paint all the weights uh, 
when we interned with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Now, for those people that are not familiar with Florida, Florida is very hot in March and April. Hmm. So we had to move all the plates outside, spray paint them black on one side, wait for them to dry, flip them over, spray paint them on the other side black, wait for them to dry, then put them back. Well, by the end of that, I had no fingerprints because they all got burned off. <laughs> <laughs> but once again, it's something that I remembered and something that I did almost 30 years ago. So it's, you know, you got to pay your dues, yeah. you know, and, and I think any veteran, any strength coach that is at the highest level, they didn't get there by luck. You know, once again, everybody sees the end result. They don't see the 20 years that it took to get to there, you know, and, 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 and the head football strength coach at uh, Georgia Tech, Lou Corella, he brought this up last week and he's like, you know, he's the, he's the director of strength and conditioning at Georgia Tech for the football program. But in order to get to that point, he's moved nine different times and he's been fired twice. Hmm. Okay. Now, if you're married with, with a family, you've been fired twice and you've moved nine times. That's not easy at okay. all. How much stress, how much stress does that put on you and your family? A lot. Yeah. But, you know, right now, and he's open and honest about it. Um, but, you know, for people that are trying to get into this profession, and I'm not trying to dissuade you at all, but understand that you're not going to get there in a year or two. It's going to take a while. And you're probably at some point in your career, whether it's right or wrong, you're going to get fired. You know? Um, that's great advice. That's just the reality of it. That's great advice. So just to wrap it up, um, for <laughs> people who are trying to get into the strength and conditioning field, uh, I think this has been an, an incredible amount of information for you. And for others that are intend to use strength and conditioning as a means to better your performance in sports, uh, think about that first antidote that Mark talked about, the progressive training. You have to get your reps in. You have to measure it. And you have to constantly be pushing yourself in order for this to work. Well, and there's a couple things. I mean, uh, the saying goes, if you're not assessing, you're guessing. Yeah. And then, and then I would first and foremost – I want you to be able to move efficiently and effectively through all three planes of motion without pain or restriction. And then we can work, then we can worry about loading you. However, we're going to load you. And then as we go through time, um, the systems are going to get more complex and the, and the exercises are going to get more complex, but we're always going to serve our big rocks and we're always going to go back to our foundation because without a strong foundation, you can't build a, a you can't build a great house. Awesome. So what do you want to do for the next episode? We usually discuss this beforehand, but we're, we're going to do it live on the air now. Um, I'm going to throw, out, I, I'm going to throw out footwork. Uh, we could go over thinking? footwork. We could go over the importance of having a mission statement for your life, or we could go over the aspects of mental health. Let's do footwork. Okay. All right, ladies All right. and gentlemen, that wraps up episode four, episode five footwork probably one of the, <laughs> the most important things in sports yeah if you can't if you can't move you're gonna you're gonna get killed <laughs> thanks for turning right. in peace all my best god bless stay safe out there appreciate you guys see you